first, a word from our sponsors. Welcome to the most exclusive social network with the most exclusive college students around. I know what you're thinking. Is this guy talking about Harvard or Harvard Connect? No, 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 no. I'm talking about Platteville Connect. You've heard that chicks want to sleep with guys from Harvard, but that's just because they haven't been to Platteville, Wisconsin before. The land of a million bars on only one street, only two restaurants, and $5 beer pitchers. Some people also think that Harvard.edu is the most exclusive email around. Well, they'd also be wrong. It's actually uwplatt.edu. Trust me, I know, because I went to Platteville, not Harvard, just to be clear. Here you'll be able to connect with friends and classmates in a way you couldn't before. Is that good-ish looking, clearly agriculture major in your econ class single? Or is or are you looking to hook up with an engineer with a bright future and lock him or her down? Check their relationship status on Platteville Connect. It'll either be in a relationship, single, or I'm open to dancing at the local club schoolgirls and have a one night stand. So again, sign up for this exclusive social network today. As a reminder, please just quickly uh, leave us a rating and review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. It costs you nothing, but it helps us out tremendously. Just quick uh, hit pause, leave us a five-star rating. Maybe leave a review with uh, your favorite segment that we do. Uh, And if you're listening to this on YouTube, leave a like. Also free for you, but helps us out a lot. Uh, so yeah, just quick press pause and then come back and fish, finish listening to the episode. Uh, and thanks in advance. All right, on with the show. Lights, camera, action. Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast, where we take deep dives into different Best Picture winning movies, the year they won, and whether they should have won or not. As always, I'm Matthew Schmidt. Here with me, with me is my beautiful and very pregnant wife, Haley Schmidt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Sorry for the delay in episode, but there may be more of those happening in the future (laughs) as we get closer and closer to October or the end of the year. Yeah, and certainly after that point as well. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, welcome to the show. Um, This week, uh, what year are we breaking down? The films of 2010 and the 83rd Academy Awards... So, the, you know, the ceremony happened in 2011, but it's the films of 2010, so we'll be talking about King's Speech, and then the most likely runner-up that year was Social Network, so those will be the two that we'll be debating, and then looking at the movies from that year. Perfect. Uh, uh, what have we been watching, reading, whatever? <laughs> uh, been... I mean, I just, the PGA Championship finished up, so I was watching that, so nothing too movie or TV related, TV show related there, but I was watching golf as I usually do, Uh, so that was fun. First major without any fans, and then the Masters today announced that they're not having any fans, so um, it is what it is with that, at least. Yeah. I could tell that you were so excited for, like, a major championship on TV. There were a number of times over the weekend. We pretty much stayed in the basement all weekend because it was so hot and humid. And there were a number of times I was upstairs and I could hear you yelling and getting excited. Mm -hmm. Throwing some F-bombs around. It was good. Good stuff. Yeah, you know what type of person I am if I get excited <laughs> and I'm yelling fuck shit and all that yeah. good stuff at golf. I was like, That's J- Jason, I Jason Day drained a long putt and I just hear, fuck yeah! And I'm like, oh, Matt is so excited that Major mm-hmm. major Golf is back. Which, you know, I... It was fun. It was a really fun tournament I to watch, actually. I didn't really notice or care about the no fans until maybe the end, the last couple of holes, when... People are starting to pull away yeah. and you kind of get an idea who's going to win and there aren't big cheers. That was really the only time I really missed the, the fans or the crowd. So it was overall, it was 
pretty good yeah. golf weekend. Yeah, so. I agree. And it was cool that Colin Morikawa won. Mm-hmm. Collie Wally, as I call him. Yep. <laughs> He's been my new, like, little pet favorite this season, yeah. so I was excited for him. <laughs> Uh, the only other thing I had here to bring up was I'm going to read some stats here because I put our top fives, for, fives from the last episode, so top five one-word titled oh, movies yeah. on Facebook as a poll <clears throat> and mm-hmm. try getting as many votes as possible <laughs> on it. Uh, there are 45 votes. Okay. Uh, 62% went to the winner. I'm going to guess it was you. No, it was you. Seriously? Yeah. (laughs) I didn't even like my list I know. I, uh, yeah, so it was it 28 people voted for you and 17 voted for me. (laughs) That's sad. Which is an absolute joke. (laughs) Um, I talked to some people who voted and they were just like, I hadn't heard of some of the movies on your list. And um, my list was Logan, Aliens, Parasite, Gladiator, and Whiplash. (laughs) Uh, I get Logan is a quote unquote superhero movie, but it like I feel like people still know of that yeah. movie. Maybe and not. And I can understand people not knowing Whiplash. Whiplash is the only one where I'm like, okay, I get it. Like that's yeah. that was kind that's of a one. smaller movie. That is one movie. Uh, that it won some awards, but not Best Picture like Parasite. Like I understand right. people maybe haven't seen Parasite, but I feel like after a one Best Picture, a lot of people have heard of it or word of mouth got around say, on that one. There's a ton of buzz and around then, that movie. And then Gladiator and Aliens are two of the most popular yeah. action movies of all time. Hundred percent. So, yeah, that okay. was um, that was slightly disappointing, <laughs> on my part. But yeah, I guess congratulations to you though on that. Yeah. Okay. Um. So for me, um, I just finished watching the latest season of Queer Eye, which was pretty good. They were in Philadelphia this season. Um, there's some good, good episodes there. I feel like the early ones were more emotional. Like, I feel like I wasn't, like, as attached to the, to the people this season, but maybe it's just, like, the types of people they had and stuff, but it was still good. Um, another Netflix show that I've been getting into is the new series of Unsolved Mysteries. I remember my parents watching that show when I was a kid, and, um... So, like, I wanted to check it out. And, yeah, some of them are, like, murders that have gone unsolved and, like, people who died with mysterious circumstances. The last episode I watched was about a UFO sighting. And, oh, my gosh, it had the most, like, compelling and convincing, like, firsthand, like, eyewitness accounts of, like, UFOs. And, like, multiple people were, like, abducted. And they talked about it, and they're like, yeah, we're on this alien ship, and I remember seeing this person, and it was nuts. So, that's been fun to watch. I don't know if that's... <laughs> yeah, that's not really up your Sounds alley. Sounds <laughs> like another cool fake alien show for you no. to watch. Or... Oh my gosh, I should make you watch it. It was so... And that's what these Ryan people... Ryan t- Gosling good in that show <laughs> yeah. with Kate McKinnon. No, seriously, I did, like, ex- as, like, these two people were talking about their abduction experience, I'm like, if the third person ends up being Kate McKinnon, and she talks about how awful her experience was, I was gonna lose it, but, um, no, it's been really fun. And then, uh, we went up to the Schmidt cabin a couple weekends ago, and... Um, we don't have internet or anything, and TV reception isn't great, so we have a ton of movies up there, and so, um, I watched Drop Dead Gorgeous for, for the first time in I don't know how many years, but such a fun movie. It's, like, a mockumentary that takes place in Minnesota. It's, like, this high school beauty pageant, and, uh, it's it's so absurd. So that was fun to watch again. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to lately. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, so there you go. Catching up in on our lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, going into the trailer park. Uh, so there, initially, you know, before we had the week delay here, there really wasn't a whole lot to talk about. There are some trailers out there, but nothing really worthwhile talking about. Like, um, Megan Fox has a weird new assassin movie coming out. Um... And the, uh, who is it? Uh, there's some uh, indie movie with Richard Jenkins, and Liam Neeson has another Taken style, like, oh, I'm a guy with skills and I'm going to kill you. I don't know, nothing worthwhile, but there, 
But then, because of this delay, there was at least one or two trailers that came out that I think were worthwhile. Uh, the big one for me was Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, so this is going to be another biopic. We've been talking about biopics a, l- a little bit yeah. on, on this podcast lately. But it's the story of Fred Hampton, the chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party, and his faithful betrayal by FBI informant William O'Neill. So, uh, true story on Fred Hampton. Uh, great star power here. So it's gonna. Uh, it's got Jesse Plemons in it as Royal Mitchell, who's like the F- uh, who is the FBI like agent. But the two mm-hmm. main people in this, uh, who I'm very excited for, is uh, Daniel Kaluuya from Get Out and Black Panther, among other things. He's Fred Hampton, and then Lakeith Stanfield is William O'Neill. So he's a member of the Black Panther Party, and I assume uh, you know. I mean, spoil, spoil alert on something that happened in real life years and years ago. <laughs> but I assume he's the person who betrays Fred Hampton to the FBI uh, in, in, I don't want to say ratting out, but kind of setting up maybe Fred Hampton for his assassination. So, yeah, I think this looks amazing. Uh, like I said, huge star power. Like, Keith Stanfield is, like, one of the biggest, like, I don't. I don't even want to say it's rising stock because I feel like it's like he's already at a point where you don't need to say he's a little known actor who's like hitting his stride. But I think he's an actor that maybe some people sleep on or like yeah. isn't as recognizable. I guess a good way to, to describe it, yeah. and I, he, he's amazing. If I could buy stock in the Keith Stanfield, I would. Because <laughs> the first thing I remember him in, I mean, he was in Get Out. He was yeah. the guy who gets kidnapped at the very beginning. Yep. Uh, but in Atlanta, that's where I think he really started to shine and then started getting roles in, uh, you know, he was in Uncut Gems and, you know, a couple other things along the way too. So Mm -hmm. I'm very, very excited for this. Also, uh, Martin Sheen is going to play J. Edgar Hoover, apparently. Yeah, that's right. So (laughs) that should be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, it looks super intense, very powerful. Um, and, you know stuff that I don't know a whole lot about um, in terms of, like, the Black Panther Party. So I'm interested, like, really interested to watch this. Yeah, directed by uh, Shaka King, who I'm trying to look up the, like, uh, IMDb filmography. I'm not seeing a whole lot there. Some TV shows. Uh, looks like this isn't going to be the directorial debut. Something in 2013 came out, but not very big or popular so you know or i guess something for shaka king to have like early uh in their career yeah so you know i don't know wrote written to uh co-written by shaka king and will uh bierson so i yeah i don't know i'm I'm excited for this uh the trailer is great got me all like pumped up and like as soon as i watched it i'm like this movie is gonna have oscar buzz this is one of those movies that as long as it's good, obviously, trailers could be kind of misleading, but this is one where I watch it and I go, as long as this is executed competently, this is going to have Oscar buzz around it. Yeah, for sure. And I like how in the trailer, it doesn't have a date, but it just says, only in theaters. <laughs> it just straight up saying, yeah. this will be in theaters, which, the way the world is right now, I feel like that can change like that. I mean, we can talk about it a little bit now if we want but like Mulan was like this is going to be in theaters this is for sure going to be in theaters and now it's coming out on streaming so Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. but we'll see I thought that was kind of funny but yeah I'm very excited for this yeah yeah no it looks super entertaining Uh, was there there were some other like TV Netflix related trailers uh, or streaming that we talked about like Away I don't know if you want to talk about Away at all yeah um so it's a Netflix series um Hilary Swank is like the lead in it and it's her and a number of other astronauts from around the world who are on this mission to Mars and um it's what by the same people who did like Friday Night Lights and Parenthood so um it seems like it'll have a real like family centered like I mean it, it's obviously like a sci-fi type thing because they're you know having this mission to Mars but um, it seems like there's a lot of uh, emotional like family centered things which are you know obviously kind of the main lines in Friday Night Lights and Parenthood so I'm sure yeah. they'll kind of it'll talk. try it's gonna try to make you cry every episode <laughs> exactly um, but you know like Hillary Swank is leaving behind her husband and daughter and. 
everyone else in the crew, um, you know, ha- have their own family and friends at home that they're missing and dealing with and stuff. But um, I, you know, I'm trying to think of like a compelling, like, I, I see, like, I, I love space travel. I love sci fi and I, I really love like space travel aspects. Like, as soon as I said, oh, we're going to Mars, like, I was hooked. But I think it'll be really interesting to see it like play out through a TV series instead of a movie. Um, but I am definitely interested. Yeah, it comes out soon-ish, September 4th. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, like, I'll give it maybe a, a shot, but, you know, it's a space adventure show, but then they're gonna really tug at the heartstrings, and I feel like if you do too much of the heartstrings, like, Parenthood was good, but there were times where I'm like, okay, you're just trying to make people cry. Oh, it's the yeah. same thing with This Is Us a little bit. Like, sometimes they go too far into it where it's almost unrealistic or disingenuine because they're trying too hard to make people cry. And doing that with space travel, I, I don't know how, that, how that'll go. Uh, I like how Netflix, they had the... Space Force earlier this year, too, where <laughs> yeah. it's, again, space-related, but more on the comedic side, and now here's another space show, but they're going on the extreme dramatic that, side No, of that things. was my thought exactly, um, yeah. So, I, I don't know, I, I kind of get schlocky feelings from this trailer where they're going, you know, as soon as she, as she goes into space, uh, her husband has, like, a medical condition, and then... You know, it seems like a soap opera, but it's set in space type thing, and I I don't know. Might be a little too much mm-hmm. for me, but mm-hmm. we'll see how it goes. Plus, uh, I've talked about with Netflix, they always do the high, high dollar production, but the substance of their products isn't always there, so I, I kind of have that feeling with this too, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm I'm excited for it because it does have like two aspects there. I, I like those emotional type shows. You are very correct that sometimes they have their episodes where it's like, okay, you're trying a little hard in terms mm-hmm. of like pulling out the heartstrings. But I love that. I've always loved space travel type stuff. So um, I'll keep this on my list. Maybe mm-hmm. it'll be one of my shows, and I'll clue you in. Yeah. Uh, it's fair. It does look, because there's multiple crew members on the ship, right? So I get the feeling of like, oh, this episode's going to be dedicated to this person and their family. Sure. And you're going to kind of get stuff like that. Yeah. So. Yep. But yeah, we'll see where that goes. The, the last, so the last thing I had to maybe talk about is Robin's uh, Wish, the Robin Williams documentary. A trailer came out for that. Uh, I just, you know, briefly to talk about it, be I just, I wanted to because Robin Williams is like most, like a lot of people our age, but I know for me, like I just grew up with him. Like when he passed away, that was tough on me because it was, I mean, Mrs. Doubtfire, he's the genie. Uh, even when I got a little older, you know, Good Will Hunting is one of my favorite movies of all time. So he's just this guy that like you kind of grew up with and when he passed away and how sudden and tragic it was, it was just tough. And then now this documentary is coming out where, you know, some newish information has been learned about, you know, how or why he passed away, you know, kind of a medical condition that he or other people may or may not have known about, which may have deteriorated his condition. Uh, so, uh, interesting. I, uh, I'll watch it because I, you know, it's Robin Williams and I kind of want to know as much ish as possible with what happened to him uh but yeah that that one's kind of interesting a documentary to maybe keep an eye out for uh, it says it's releasing september 1st i'm not sure how that's gonna work with theaters or streaming or anything maybe i'll work i'll try to look into like how people can watch it if if you had any thoughts about it yeah no i um it's, yeah, it, it seems like it'll be a nice mix of, like, <clears throat> like, it's not just going to be, like, hey, here's a story of Robin Williams and his career, and then, you know, he tragically took his life, and that's the end, but it seems like it'll be kind of interwoven with, like, hey, here are things that he struggled with throughout his life, like, you know, when he did commit suicide, people talked about, like, depression and other, uh, like, substance abuse, other issues that he had, but, um, 
the documentary, at least in the trailer, kind of gets into the fact that um, it appears he had uh, symptoms of, like, early onset dementia and um, really just, like, how that impacted his health and his well-being. And um, but at the same time, like, they're approaching it from, like, it seemed like a very, like, positive perspective and not just like, oh, isn't this so sad and this is what happened to him and we just all feel terrible about it. And it's like, yeah, we still do feel bad about it, but I, I think they're kind of getting at, like, hey, here's information we have and this can help other people. And he still managed to have a great life even, like, in the midst of dealing with all this. So um, I had very positive, like, feelings towards it watching the trailer. Yeah. Apparently it's on-demand digital release September 1st. Okay. So, if people are, yeah, so if people are interested, keep an eye out for that. Because, yeah, we just came up to what I think is like the six-year anniversary of his death. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 2014, so yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's crazy to think that it's been that long already. Mm -hmm, very, very true. But, yeah. Um, all right, so going into news, really just a couple things, uh... I kind of talked about it already, but I didn't have this on the original docket, but I think the news came out on it uh, recently, but uh, Mulan is not going to be hitting theaters. It's going to be put on Disney+, Plus, but not for free, for $30. Um, and it's not a rental, it's a 30 and you keep it, or you keep it as long as you have your Disney Plus account. Mm -hmm. So... Thoughts. I, I, I kind of know what you're going to say, but thoughts about a movie costing $30 to watch? I've seen, a, well, okay, I guess I saw one article. Um, but yeah, parents are like furious about the price of it. And at first when you told me like, oh, hey, Mulan's finally going to be here. And I was so excited because I've been looking forward to that movie. You said it's $30. I'm like, ugh, I don't know if I want to spend 30 bucks. But I mean, the fact that it's like you own it and then you always have it like... I don't know. I'm not, I guess I'm not that torn up about it. Yeah, I think 30 is a little steep. I think they're kind of seeing how far they can stretch <laughs> it. It's kind of a, you know, they're testing the waters for yeah, anything. Yeah, no, in the for sure. I mean, I, I think my first comment when I heard it was 30 bucks, I was like, because we've seen others that are in like 20, 25 dollars, kind of in that range. But um, I mean, this was supposed to be just a huge, like a absolute blockbuster so you're right i think they're trying to get uh <laughs> see what they can get away with i mean if you have like a family and your kids watch that i mean parents would definitely pay three bucks for frozen right <laughs> yeah but uh, the flip side is you could just put on the cartoon mulan and have your kids watch that <laughs> watch instead of freak. yeah instead of the live very action true. one very true so yeah i don't know we'll see mm -hmm. uh emmy nominations came out uh, do we care? Do we care about Emmy nominations? Not as much. I, I, I always, whenever the Emmys are on, I was like, oh, I should watch this. And then I very quickly lose interest. There's just too, I don't There's care. There's so much TV. I, I care a little bit. Yeah. But not barely anything because the Oscars are kind of nice because it's obviously movies. So if you see 10 movies get nominated... You can, you know, do the Marcus Theater, maybe not this year, but you can do the Marcus Theater Best Picture Festival and in a weekend or two, then we've seen all the movies. For TV, I mean, you gotta watch an hour an episode, minimum, you know, usually 13 episodes, and if it's season three of a show that's up for it, nominations, then you gotta go back and watch season... It's TV is such a time commitment, and there's so much TV out there, I just don't end up watching <laughs> yeah. anything. Uh, like, this year, this year I care a little bit because some of the TV shows I watched did get nominated, so that's exciting. Watchmen has the most nominations with 11, which I loved Watchmen. And that's nice because that was like a one-season limited series that like you can just watch all of them and done. Succession has the next most, and that's a show where it's, I haven't seen it, and they're in season two or three, so to get caught up, I'd have to go back and watch how much. Same thing with Ozark and Marvelous Miss Maisel. Schitt's Creek got eight nominations, though, and that's nice. That's a show that we got caught up on, but that one's, that was easy. It was like 20 minutes an episode. I was going to say, when they're comedies, and yeah, there's like 
what, 14 episodes a season. Yeah, we went through that very oh. quickly. Um, Regis Philbin, Olivia de Havilland, Wilfred Brimley all passed away in the last couple weeks uh, since we did our last episode. Uh, and Regis was, like, was my childhood, right? Like, who didn't watch Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? As, like, as a kid, and then, you know, he had how many talk shows on, on the side as well. Oh, yeah, exactly. And it's like he he actually has a Guinness Book of World Records for most hours on television. Like, mm-hmm. more than any other person. So he's just, he's done so much stuff. And, um, so yeah, he was 88 years old and he passed away. But you're right, like, you just think about the impact of the, of him and the shows that he's on. It's like, anytime you're doing, like any sort of trivia people are always like is that your final answer like that comes straight from him doing who wants to be a millionaire and like that yeah. show's he was, still on he know? was like perfect for that show oh, yeah. when he got replaced i know i immediately like lost interest in it i don't <laughs> even know like they've gone through a couple i'm saying i think different... chris, chris harrison from the bachelor and bachelorette is is hosting right now oh really okay i'm pretty I, sure yeah i just I or last knew, i knew anyway i just knew they had a couple different hosts since since him mm-hmm. and none of them were ever as exciting to me um and then yeah uh we're talking about uh olivia de Havilland. i hope i'm saying that right um she was 104 years old which is uh pretty impressive um she had a number of oscar nominations uh throughout her career the biggest thing that she was in she was in gone with the wind and then of course wilford brimley passed away um at the age of 85, he did a number of, uh, mostly like TV spots, but I feel like most people our age know him as the diabetes guy from the commercials on like true. daytime television, um, which that's, that's always the first thing I think of, uh, in regards to him. But like I said, he had done a number of, um, TV shows, kind of like Westerns was kind of like his sort of go-to, it seemed like, but um yeah he passed away not too long ago as well mm, i always think of him from the thing yes or cocoon yes uh, but yeah unfortunately uh, a couple um big names in the last couple weeks uh passed away so uh, all right so moving on to uh the king's speech well here did you want to bring us into sure yeah um so yeah like i said it's best picture winner uh, from 2010, it's uh, kind of the biography of King George the Sixth and his speech therapist that helped him overcome his stutter or his stammer. Um, as I say, kind of like as he rose, like to become king on the British throne. So this movie was directed by Tom Hooper, um, who has also done other Oscar-nominated films like uh, Les, Cats. M- Les Mis and The Danish Girl. Uh, he did direct Cats, which has had zero Oscar buzz. Um, but, uh, yeah, he has done some good things. He's got a weird filmography. He's got some yeah. decent movies and then some really, some bad movies, too. <laughs> yeah. um, the uh, screenplay was written by David Seidler. Um, the movie stars Colin Firth as Prince Albert, uh, later to be known as King George the Sixth. Uh, Jeffrey Rush plays his speech therapist, Lionel Logue. And Helena Bonham Carter plays, uh, Prince Albert's wife, Elizabeth, um, future queen, of course. Um, <clears throat> this movie was nominated for 12 Oscars and it won four. Um, it won Best Picture. Colin Firth won Lead Actor. Tom Hooper won Best Actor, or Best Director, excuse me, um, and then David Seidler won for Original Screenplay. Uh, the other eight nominations they had were Supporting Actor for Jeffrey Rush, Supporting Actress for Helena Bonham Carter, Cinematography, Film Editing, Costume Design, Original Score, Sound Mixing, and Art Decoration. Yeah, Art Decoration. I thought I read that wrong. <laughs> I, like, read it, but a different word, like, echoed in my brain, I swear. Um, So those are kind of the basics behind the movie. Um, And, yeah, it it really is, um, you know, kind of talks about, well, it starts with um, Colin Firth, like, as Prince being, like, having to deliver this message to, like, this huge crowd of people live. And he just, he struggles through the whole thing. And so it's kind of his journey overcoming this, 
um, like speech impediment that he has. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's exactly. So it opens up with him at yeah, Wembley Stadium. Uh, not being able to do a speech and his wife is trying to find a teacher for him because the ones they're using aren't really doing anything. I think the first one we see, they're putting like these glass marbles or balls that are straight, soaked in whiskey or something. Straight in his out mouth. of Henry Higgins playbook, yeah, right? Yeah, big time Henry Higgins <laughs> vibes there. <laughs> My Fair Lady callback, um, yes. And I like how... Yeah, Helen Bonham Carter, like, her character, she points out, like, why are we doing this? And he's like, oh, well, they used to do this in ancient Egypt or Rome or ancient whatever. Greece. The hell, Greece. And, yeah. And she's like, yeah, but has it worked since then? Like, what are we doing here? Like, yeah. this is ridiculous. We're in the 20th <laughs> century now. Like, like thank you. I was screaming at the TV in My Fair Lady when... Does any of this shit work? Like, what are we <laughs> doing here? Uh, and then, like, she finally says it. Uh, so she goes looking for, uh, you know, I think at the time a controversial speech therapist, but I think in our day and age it's a, an actual speech therapist who can actually help with things. And she finds uh, Lionel Logue, as he said, played by Jeffrey Rush, who is... Uh, yeah, kind of considered an unorthodox-ish instructor, uh, but, you know, she kind of likes him for whatever reason, and... Uh, like, he had been recommended to her from, I, yeah. like, a few people or something, yeah. so... And, uh, so, you know, she brings her, her husband to meet him, and they're pretending to be the Johnsons. Of course, it's the Johnsons. <laughs> That's one of those things, we're watching the movie, you're like, is that made up? Probably. It's probably made up. Um... <laughs> But they meet and what's uh okay I just want to call him George the King George the Sixth or what's Albert the, Albert sorry yeah Albert, Albert is just not about it he's just I don't want to be here it's a stammer I just have to deal with it I want it to go away but like I can't whatever he's frustrated all the time and I like Lionel bets him uh, that he can like get him to actually talk you know without the stammer and I like what he does he puts headphones on him so he can't hear himself talk and then has like records him speaking and then albert's like okay no i'm not about this and then listens to the play back later on and when he listens to it there's no stammer at all and uh so it's kind of proof like this is in your head it isn't anything physical because mm -hmm. if you don't hear yourself talk or think about it see look you sound normal yep which why didn't he do the final speech like that <laughs> good yeah maybe it's, good maybe it's just too long to listen to like loud music for 10 minutes or however long the speech was yeah. at the end but i was like well and plus that's like just masking the issue instead of like solving the yeah like, but like of it. for like a 10 minute speech like i'll mask it just to get by that 10 minutes and then we'll work on it later but hey you know whatever <laughs> that's just I'm getting nitpicky there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so this movie, yeah, it's kind of two storylines of him working with Lionel to get rid of the stammer, while then at the same time, and this is something I didn't know about, and I just don't really know a lot about, like, old British royal family stuff. Uh, probably why I don't, I don't love The Crown, or maybe I just should watch The Crown, because it'll educate me, some people mm, tell me, but it's so whatever. so dry. Um, I didn't know that... He had an older brother who, like, gave up the throne, who was played by Guy Pearce in this movie. Oh, yeah, is, I, didn't, I didn't mention him, yep. Yeah, which is, which is, that's interesting stuff to me. It's kind of like the two popes, like, uh, oh, yeah. you know, there has never been, or there hadn't been in so long, like, two popes living at the same time and kind of giving up the seat to that one. That, I mean, it's kind of similar in the sense of Guy Pearce, uh, you know, his, um, his character, is madly in love with, I think she's an American yep. kind of socialite, they say, yep. who is twice divorced. <laughs> so the royal family is very much like, you cannot marry her. Like, she, you cannot do this. You're the head of the ki Church of England, and this is not allowed in the Church of England, which which is weird. So we had watched uh, Man for All Seasons, which yep. is about how, uh, how um, King, King Henry, Henry the VIII. Eighth. Yes. There's... Sorry, I'm like talking over you, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, 
King Henry VIII uh, started the Church of England, and he started it because he wanted to get a divorce. And yes. here we are, however many years later, and Guy Pearce, like he wants to marry someone who has had multiple divorces, and he's not allowed to, like a uh, double standard there, I guess. But yeah. anyway, so he gives up the throne because he wants to be with her, and then that's how Albert gets the throne and becomes king. Uh, And then kind of him and Lionel, they're still working together and they have a couple little speeches or things here and there that he helps them out with. But then it kind of culminates with World War II starting uh, and, you know, him as the king, he has to give this like nine or ten minute speech to the country or the world, really, whoever's listening, you know, basically like we're entering the war, but like, don't worry, we're going to be okay. Like this big monumental speech and... So that's that's the climax of the movie is him getting ready for that, and then uh, you know which is cool. You kind of I like how they bring him into this room and it's you know blankets on the wall and they're like soundproofing it and all this stuff. And Lionel is is there to kind of walk him through uh, the speech, uh, which is cool. I like how he has different triggers for everything. Like he can't, uh, he can't start a P or or yeah. something like that. Yeah, so he it, struggles like when words start with the letter P. So like yeah. when he has to say people, he's like, like a people. It's yeah, like, walk your, into it. Yes, get yourself into the word. Uh, or um, he'll kind of swear to himself like fuck, fuck, shit, shit, like to to get going for whatever reason. So I, I like how in that. 10 minute speech Lionel's there and he's kind of helping him like work into it. He's like orchestrating it almost. And uh, he does a great job uh, essentially and I also like how after he leaves that room with all the blankets he goes and sits at his desk and they take a picture like pretending that he gave the speech Mm -hmm. from there. That was a nice touch. And those are moments in movies I like. It's like show don't tell we talk about that and that's an example of doing it right where they don't have to say oh, now let's walk over to the desk and let's take this fake picture. Like, he just does it and you kind of get the gist and it's kind of a nice little, yeah, I see what you're doing there. I like, like, that's funny. I get yeah, it. Cool so tricks and stuff. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, that's essentially what the what the movie's about. Uh, when I, I remember when I first saw this, I, just, I watched and I went, okay, this is good. I very much enjoyed this movie. But, damn, this is an Oscar Beatty kind of movie. <laughs> like royal family like this prestige i don't know it just felt like such an oscar Beatty movie to me but you know we can get into that later overall i enjoyed this movie a lot uh what did you think of the king's speech yeah no it's super enjoyable um and this was the second time i had watched it and i like i remember liking it the first time but not really thinking much like there wasn't much remarkable about it but honestly i enjoyed this so much the second time around It was so much funnier and, like, more clever than I had remembered. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, just spending more time, you and I, like, paying attention to more of, like, the technical stuff, um, like, with movies and how they're created and directed and stuff like that. Like, the cinematography in this movie was amazing. I loved it. Um, So it was just, it was was super entertaining. And and to me, like, yeah, I, I just loved the... Um, like the humor in it because yeah you have Jeffrey Rush as the therapist and Lionel Logue and yeah he's he's unorthodox and he um, is working with this British royal who's trying to be all uh, stuffy and matter of fact and he's like oh I must call you doctor and you must call me Albert and he's like no that no it's, I'm not gonna call you that and he's like Bertie that, that's what I'm gonna call you he's like oh but only only my close family calls me that. He's like, okay, well, I'm calling you Birdie. This is a comfortable place. We mm-hmm. need to get to know each other. Um, but like you said, when uh, when uh, Elizabeth first goes to Lionel and she's like, oh, yes, I'm Mrs. Johnson, you know, and then eventually, like, he finds out that she's... Elizabeth and she's there for her husband, Prince Albert. He's like, oh, um yes and he kind of hesitates and she's like you can refer to me as your royal highness he's like yes um your royal highness like just that like awkwardness of the two of them i think was so funny and um i think uh, i probably laughed the hardest when uh lionel saying like birdie all of your physicians like they're all idiots all the stuff that they're telling you it's it's all worthless and he's like 
yeah, but they're all knighted. And he's like, oh, well, that makes them official idiots then, you know? <laughs> like, just yeah, that they're, they're banter back snarky. and forth. Yeah, the three of them, yeah, there's some, yeah, clever jokes or snarkiness mm-hmm. to, to all of them that were pretty good. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, what was it? I saw some trivia, so trivia, quick trivia time, uh, that this movie was like 70-ish, 5 Seventy-five ish percent accurate, but uh, you know him calling the king birdie was one of the things people were like. I, I don't know if that's actually true. Okay. Like that was very much a family only thing. It's kind of nice in the movie to do because it makes Lionel and him like seem very very close. Which you know, I think they were in real life. Uh, they were very close friends, but I think that was one of the things where it's like, I don't know how. Maybe he didn't call him that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also, this is, I know I mentioned this to you, one of the things that was also kind of incorrect about the movie is the timeline. Apparently, like, all this stuff with Lionel like, happened in the early uh, 20s or mid-20s, like in the 1926 time, but then the movie changes it to, you know, close to World War Two, and... You know, even while in real life Lionel was with him pretty much the rest of his life and was probably there for that speech at the end, they just kind of shifted the timeline a little bit there Mm -hmm. to kind of have it fit a better, (laughs) you know, story or narrative. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, overall very enjoyable and mostly accurate movie, which is hard to say, uh, you know, this day and age all the time, so. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and... What I think I had missed out on the first time around, and I think was much more apparent this, you know, watching it again, is <clears throat> just like, kind of like you were saying, is the unprecedented situation he found himself in. Like, um, Prince Albert talks about, like, th- this uh, nurse or nanny, whatever, that helped raise him and was just like, awful and he's like that that's when my stammer started so like he talks about like this past trauma that he's had he's always kind of felt inadequate because you're right like he he's not the firstborn son he has never really had the expectation of okay yeah, i'll be king someday whatever um and he's kind of being thrust into the spotlight when i mean because like elizabeth was able to just walk into lionel's office and he had no idea who she was like there was that time like they didn't necessarily recognize everyone in the royal family. Like, it's not like it is now. And so Birdie's coming into this time where it's like, hey, we're doing radio broadcasts that are being spread all over the world. And hey, we're starting to do more photo opportunities. And so now all of a sudden, this thing that he could hide about himself is now super public. And hello, like, they're on the brink of war, (laughs) like literal world war. And it's like he, he was dealing with so much stuff. And he mentions in the movie, just like you were saying earlier, he's like, I'm the first monarch to follow someone who didn't die. Yeah, yeah, like his you know? brother. The same yeah. as his brother still. Yeah. Like, yeah. Which is, again, like the two popes. Like, <laughs> exactly. The current pope, like, the previous one is still alive. So that's just kind of weird. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just like the, <clears throat> like, extremely complex situation he was finding himself in, it's like, as if him trying to manage and, like, deal with his, um, like, speech issues wasn't, like, <laughs> weighing on him enough. It's, like, all this other stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought Helena Bonham Carter did a really beautiful job playing his yeah, wife. she was great. She was great. All three of the, like, the main characters were, they were fantastic. I, all three of them were nominated for Oscars, like you said. Peter Firth won. Uh, yeah, I mean, all three of them. Colin. Colin. Sorry. Who's Peter Firth? Uh, I don't. Is that a made-up person? Colin. Colin Farrell. That's that's probably <laughs> what I was. Will Farrell. It's like a tree of names yeah. there. Um, oh, Peter Firth is a real person. I would say it sounds like someone, but I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, Helena Bonham Carter. I thought she was she was so good. Like she had that like you know, traditional, like, stiff upper lip kind of thing, where she's like, you can call me your royal highness, and blah, 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 and I am very proper. But um, she's so sweet and caring with Birdie, and I loved when, yeah, he takes the recording back of him, like, 
speaking, you know, like, uh, Lionel had recorded him while he was, like, listening to music, and she's just, like, amazed that he's speaking perfectly and clearly, and she's like, okay, yeah, we need, we need to keep working with this guy. Like, she's so, like, Mm -hmm. attentive about that. Smokes like a chimney. Yes. Which is, like, what what led to his death. Yeah. (laughs) Which is part, which is in the crown. You know, we started the crown but didn't finish it, but that's kind of what his downfall is. He dies of cancer? Lung cancer, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he, I, like, in the movie, you go, oh, the doctors say it calms me down. Yeah. And Lionel's <laughs> like, yeah, no. <laughs> I think that's when they kind of get into their conversation of your physicians are idiots. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, a- anything else that you liked that you wanted to talk about? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you know, overall, very, very, very enjoyable. We'll get into the scores later. Mm-hmm. We'll give both this score and the social network at the same time when we're done uh, doing our debate. But yeah, I'm very, very good. I think uh, because I had that initial, I, I was happy I, re- I rewatched it too because I hadn't seen it since it, it first came out. And I just remember having that taste in my mouth of, Oh, it's such an Oscar Beatty movie. Like, is it really that good? So it was nice to rewatch it because it was very, very good. And yeah. A li- and probably a little bit better than I remembered it being. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, let's do a quick review or chit chat on The Social Network, which we also rewatched uh, this past weekend. So, uh, yeah, it's, ba- I mean, this movie, it's about the founders and making of Facebook. And kind of the start, even though I think MySpace was around already and a couple other ones. And yeah. Friendster, I think they say it in the movie, actually. Uh, so it isn't the first uh, so, like uh, social network, you know, platform, but it's, you know, basically the start of where we're at in the world now. Uh, so, yeah, what, what did you think of the social network? Um, it, it's one of those things that kind of in the opposite way of King's speech. Like, I enjoyed it much more the second time around. I think this is maybe, like, the third, maybe even fourth time I've seen Social Network. And um, it doesn't have as much impact. And maybe part of that is just because, okay, yeah, like, we all know the story of Mark Zuckerberg now. Um, But it's, you know, it's... I like how they bounce back and forth between him creating Facebook in, like, the early days, but then also jumping ahead to the quote-unquote current day or present time when he's going through these lawsuits with all these people that, um, like, started the company with him. So I I thought that was really interesting to kind of go back and forth and and really, like, your constant question or, like, the theme that kind of goes through the whole movie is, like, what is Mark's motivation for this? Like, they kind of throw, like, is love his motivation like, with this ex-girlfriend thing, like, is about being popular, being, like, included with, like, these finals clubs. There's, you, like, just want to be cool, like Sean Parker, you know? Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's an enjoyable movie, and like I said, I think when it, when it first came out, like, I felt like I learned a lot about him and how it was created, and, um, you know, maybe something that hasn't, like, held up as well, but I think we just know more about it. Mm-hmm. And I quickly should note, so directed by David Fincher, uh, screenplay by Aaron Sorkin. So, you know, you talk about switching between the two different kind of timelines. Yeah. And, and I really like the dialogue in this movie. I mean, that's this movie is Aaron Sorkin maybe at his best. He's one of the best screenwriters around. I think this is his only Oscar win of his career, but he wrote, uh, you know, A Few Good Men. Uh, he wrote and directed Molly's Game. So, he, I'm a big-time writer, so he wrote this. Stars Jesse Eisenberg is, uh, obviously Mark Zuckerberg. Andrew Garfield is in this, along with, you know, Justin Timberlake, as Sean Parker. Army Hammer plays two people, both the Winkle okay. bosses. Yep. Um, uh, a couple the, of people. The, the Winkle Vi, as Winkle I Vi, think. yeah. Uh, a couple point. of people that I always forget are in this is, one, Dakota Johnson has a scene in this. Yep. Uh, but two, whenever we watch this movie, I always go, oh yeah, Rashida Jones is in this movie. Yeah. I could, I always forget she's in this movie, mm-hmm. but she is. She plays you know, one of his lawyers. who She doesn't do a lot until the very end of the movie. Uh, but yeah, I just, I always forget that she's, she's in this. Uh, unlike uh, King's Speech, 
Well, like King's Speech is based off like real people and true story, but unlike King's Speech, the historical accuracy is kind of in question on this movie. Uh, and I think Aaron Sorkin is kind of on record of saying, like, listen, I just I wanted to make an entertaining movie. Yeah. So, you know, is Mark Zuckerberg as big of a jerk as what is portrayed by Jesse Eisenberg in this <laughs> movie? I don't know. I think most people would say probably not. Um, and while, like, certain events in this movie did happen, you know, how accurate is this movie is kind of in question. Does that really matter to me? No, not really, because, like, again, it's not a documentary, it's just, it's a movie, and, you know, you shouldn't always believe what you see in an actual movie. I think people should, should know to kind of, <laughs> would know where to draw the line. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Mark Zuckerberg was pretty upset, because I think the script of this movie got leaked a little bit beforehand, and I think Mark Zuckerberg, like, kind of saw he was going to be portrayed in maybe not the best light. And he was pretty upset about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but yeah, just wanted to touch on that. Anything that I say about the movie is really just about the characters that are being portrayed, not necessarily the real-life person. I'm sure people, maybe ourselves included, have opinions on Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook and, like, real life. But, but we're just... We're, I'm going to just talk about, basically, like, the portrayal and the movie. Yeah. Uh, and that is... Uh, Jesse Eisberg is fantastic at playing this character, but what an unlikable character. Oh my gosh, yeah. Petty as fuck. And holds these menial grudges that, like, shouldn't really matter. Right, and that's, in like I was saying, like, in terms of, like, a theme running through this is, like, what what motivates him, and it's, like... Yeah. yeah Which is an interesting plot to the movie. See him, yeah, he's, you know, they very end of the movie you see him like refreshing a friend request <laughs> yeah. to like this ex-girlfriend and so it's like oh my god this is how many years later like do you really care like she's the reason you started this whole thing in a sense um but yeah just the like eduardo's whole thing thing the whole time is like oh my god is this because i got into the phoenix is this because i was in these clubs and you weren't and it's like yeah so questions like what what is this guy's deal you know, mm-hmm. like, like, what, what does he care about? Like, is he really, like, is he just petty? Does he want to... seems, that's kind of how he's portrayed. <laughs> you know? like, yes, yeah. he is kind of petty. He, yeah, definitely seems to hold grudges. He's planting stories about, uh, Edward, or Eduardo Safran, like, be, cruelty to animals in the newspaper and being pissed that he's credited as a co-founder of facebook and Mm -hmm. yeah just just petty just so petty in this movie uh and he's just very much i just care about myself and no one else like get out of the way like he just uses eduardo for money to get it started and doesn't really care about him in the end and you know he's just doing what he can to get what he wants Mm -hmm. and or or to yeah to kind of look cool like because you're right he kind of views sean parker just you know justin timberlake's character as the cool guy, like, he's the cool kid at the table I want to go sit next to at lunch. Uh, so he basically just wants to impress him, so he's doing all these things for him, like, go to business meetings in a robe and tell people, like, fuck you and all this stuff. And, yeah, he just seems very petty and self-centered as a character in this movie. And this is very... Jesse Eisberg plays it great, but it's just so unlikable. Yeah, no, I agree. Um... One thing I kind of wanted to circle back on is you talk about Aaron Sorkin doing the screenplay. And, like, I would say overall it was good, but there were definitely some lines in here that I just, like, I cringed at how cheesy they were. Like what? Um, I usually like his dialogue, but yeah, like what? (laughs) Like, um, when Mark runs into this ex-girlfriend Erica in a restaurant and... You know, he he thinks he's, like, showing off, like, hey, look at how successful this has been so far kind of thing. And she's like, words hurt people, Mark. The internet isn't written in pencil. It's written in ink. And I was just like, oh, my God, that is such a bad line. And, like, later when uh, the Winklevoss twins, and I can't remember the name of the third guy they're with, but once they realize that Mark, because they kind of recruit Mark, like, hey, help us create this Harvard connection thing. And which, they find oh, out... they're so douchey, too. Oh, like, God. Like, wait, uh, sorry to interrupt. I'll, I'll just get back to it. But like, not a lot of people are very likable in this movie. Mm, and no. they suck, too. 
I like how their big, uh, like, draw for their social media thing is harvard.edu. Yeah. It's exclusive. It's exclusive, and girls want to sleep with guys who go to Harvard, so we're going to exploit that. (laughs) I'm just like, oh, my God, you guys fucking suck, too. (laughs) Anyway, sorry, go on. But, yeah, it's like the third guy they're working with to create this uh, Harvard connection. Once I find out that Mark Zuckerberg has you know, basically created Facebook and very similar um, idea to what they wanted Harvard Connection to be. Like, he gets up, he, like, throws down his books, and he's like, let's gut the freaking nerd. I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, ugh. Like, there were were just moments I'm like, I could come up with a better line than that, and I'm not, like, good at this at all. Yeah, some of those do sound kind of corny, but I think there are a lot of... Sorry, were you gonna, were you going to say something else? No, I mean I was just saying like like overall I agree that like the script was was good, but there were just moments where I'm like like certain lines of dialogue were just they were so cringy. Yeah, I, I get that. I just, I think there's a lot that weren't though, and not a lot of people other than Aaron Sorkin could do. Kind of like what you were talking about the Winklevoss, and I should just try to find the name of of the third guy. Uh, it was played by Max uh, Minghella, who is the son of Anthony Minghella, who he won an Oscar for directing English Patient. It's a little side note there. Oh, nice. Um, uh, Narendra, that's his last name. Narendra, I'm butchering that. Anyways, uh, when they're, I like kind of the back and forth between the timeline. So they're, he's reading emails from... Uh, Mark basically blowing them off, but then they'll go to like his lawyer in the future who is kind of doing the same thing. And mm-hmm. I like how it's kind of a trail of like you're hearing all the emails, but from different people, like right in a row, uh, which was really cool. And uh, I also like it when, like, dialogue wise, when he's drunk and you know he gets dumped by uh, Rooney Mara and he's uh, starting the Facebook and He's kind of like narrating in his mind like what he's doing. Okay, I'm going into this Facebook now. Oh, if you uh, do an empty search, then you get all these results. And, you know, some of it can kind of go over some people's head, but it's uh, kind of uh, uh, easy-ish enough to follow. It's kind of, like, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Like, you kind of get like, a little you, insight on yeah, what's I mean, going on. Yeah, I you understand some of the, like, coding language that he's talking about. Me, who knows nothing about that, like, you understand how he was going through, like, house by house at Harvard being like, okay, this was an easy one to get into, or this one was difficult, or uh, this one looked difficult at first, but really if I just do this, then that'll make the whole process this efficient. And so it's like you understood what he was doing and how mm-hmm. he was getting into it. So, yeah, yeah. no, that, that was cool because he was, like, blogging as he's doing yeah. it. Which, side note with that, do I don't, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't actually think Mark Zuckerberg's blog at the time would have been popular popular enough to for that many people to read because so he got dumped and then started making fun of her like, cup size and like that she's a prude or something like that yeah. and then like, five seconds later it's like she gets home from breaking up with mark to her dorm and her roommate's like, oh my god, he's blogging about you. And then these random guys walk by her room, which she doesn't go to Harvard. She goes to a different college. And these she guys... She goes to BU, yeah, remember? Yeah, BU. You don't have to study. <laughs> yeah. You go to BU, what is what dick. he says. What a dick. Yeah. Um, and then these guys are, like, holding a bra. saying, oh, is this pig? I'm like, do these guys who go to BU, are they really reading Mark Zuckerberg's <laughs> blog? Like, I don't know. That seemed kind of weird or not too... I could be wrong, but not too realistic to me. Uh, but like that scene you were talking about where she says, oh, it's ring- written in ink or in pen, not in pencil. There, There's another sign of like right after that scene, like that in that scene, Mark goes, we have to expand. Like that, there's his motivation of like, I, I'm trying to impress her. Mm-hmm. So just mm-hmm. a little side note, since he brought that scene up, I wanted to bring it up. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, any other, any other thoughts on social network? Last thing I said, it's kind of weird or funny. I started chuckling in the movie when he goes, I don't want ads. Ads aren't cool. And to look at what Facebook is now, it's like, okay, all right, whatever, dude. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, 
Oh, man. It's also funny just looking back at a movie. Like, it's, it's still a really good movie, but it's about the start of Facebook. And I just look at it, and I'm like... I know a lot of people, obviously a lot of people still use Facebook, but a lot of my friends and you, you in, like included in this group of people that I know, like just don't use Facebook anymore. I was say, I don't even have a Facebook anymore because it's just, yeah, it just, it turned into crap. Like I was saying, yeah. like that, that was actually enjoyable about watching this movie. I feel, is this what it's like to be old? You know, oh, back in my day, I liked, <laughs> I liked the old Facebook, you know, but I liked that it was like actually about like communicating with other people and staying in touch with other people and you can share stuff but everything now is just like look at me and it's i don't know it's annoying yeah no i hear you also a quick shout out uh brenda song is in this movie Mm -hmm. uh she's disney channel girl from sweet life of zach and cody among other things she plays psychopath uh girlfriend (laughs) who has sex with uh eduardo saverin in a bathroom and then lights his room on fire so (laughs) yeah there you go. Quick, quick side note there. All right. So quickly before diving into real justice, a couple shout outs here. Uh, I sent out the emojis for these two movies on different social media platforms and asked people to guess. Uh, so just really quick uh, on Instagram, the first person to get the emojis right was someone who's been on the podcast before. Can you guess? It's three people, one of three. I know. Josh. No. Allie. Yes. Hey, good job, girl. <laughs> Allie. She said the King's speech on the social network, question mark. So not 100% <laughs> confidence there, but I guess we'll give it yeah, to she her. She should have been. She got it right. Uh, on Twitter, uh, a different podcast, the My Drunk Movie Theater podcast, uh, guessed correctly. Uh, and I replied with correct, and they replied with the uh, gif of Homer Simpson going, woohoo! So, <laughs> nice. thanks for your, your participation. Appreciate that. And then on Facebook, uh, Liz Kurth guessed correctly with, uh, yeah, obviously the King's Speech and Social Network. So, thank you very much. I also, so thank you for the participation. Appreciate it. Uh, on Facebook also posted, like, oh, we were going to be talking about these two movies. And I guess probably because of the most recent two that we've uh, talked about, some people had some thoughts. Uh, uh, someone, Brett MacArthur, said the one with uh, <laughs> Cologne Firth, Jeffrey Rush, and Helen Bonham Carter. Uh, Asterix, no edit. I said cologne, and now I won't change it. <laughs> uh, and then, but a couple other people said social networks. So I think this one was a little more divided on what on what people actually thought was better. But sure. just wanted to uh, give those shout outs really quick. Awesome. And I'll be and I'll post the next one too. So uh, you, you know, if you're listening, keep an eye out on those social media platforms and take a guess on what our next movie debate will be on. Okay, so let's dive into our uh, debate. So, kind of the same categories, but, you know, we're going to maybe tweak this as we go until we get to a point where we actually, like, you know, we're we're tweaking it until we think we're getting it right. We still have the same categories of uh, technical and visuals and writing and all that stuff, but we're doing, we each get to assign two points or two tallies to each category, so that way if we really strongly feel like one movie was better, we can kind of weight it in their favor. Uh, so yeah, technical and visuals is one. Songs and score, so kind of separating those two out a little bit. Story versus and writing, because it's kind of like dialogue versus just the story, which one is better. Uh, and then acting is leading and supporting. So you can, you know, you can kind of assign one, if you felt like one movie had a better lead performance, while one movie had a better supporting act, like performance, you can give one to each. And then for uh, which movie's better, you kind of have two for best and favorite. So, you know, maybe you give both to one movie, maybe you split them, like who knows. So we'll see how this goes. Okay, so first up is technical and visuals. So this is... You know, costume design, visual effects, cinematography, set design, kind of all that stuff is kind of encompassed in this. So there's a lot there. Um, 
So with my two points or tallies, uh, I'm going to give one to each movie uh, because, you know, King's Speech, it is a period piece, so there are costume design uh, aspects of this movie that I appreciate and like. But David Fincher just has this look to his movies that I really, really like. It's kind of a darker tone or look to them that it's, it's hard for me to describe, but I just, I like them. Um, and oddly enough, this is kind of a period piece too. Not, I mean, not really, it's like 2000s look, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I'm giving one to each. You know, I kind of appreciate, I appreciate both is kind of hard to, to pick like a clear winner. Like neither of these are amazing, amazing. I, I'd say the costume design is pretty good in King's Speech, I guess, but it's close enough where I'm giving one point to each. Okay. Um, for me, I am giving both of my tallies, points, whatever we want to call them, towards uh, King's Speech. Um, I would agree that neither is, like, going to blow you away, but I, um, I, I actually really enjoyed kind of the, the tone that King's Speech has in terms of, like, so much of it takes place in Lionel's, um, like, his home, his office, and it's, like, the walls are kind of peeling, and, like, the windows are dirty, and just, like, I like the idea of having this, like, royal figure in this kind of, like, darker place, and, um, like I mentioned before, too, like, the cinematography, I loved it. Like, there are a few scenes where it's, like, you know, Bertie and Elizabeth are, like, walking down this winding staircase, and it's a continuous shot for, like, more than a minute. Or, like, they'll show Bertie and Lionel working together, and they, like, zoom into this couch, and they zoom back out, and they're doing another thing. And so it's, like, they had really clever ways to show, like, time passing. So for me, that stood out a lot more than um, anything that they did in Social Network. Okay. That's fair. Like, it was close, so yeah, it's yeah. kind of however you want to take it. Uh, so songs and scores, so you kind of get one for each, just which songs did you like more, or which score did you like more, if one really overloaded the other that you liked. For me, both are going to the social network here for me. I couldn't even tell you the theme song or a song from the King's Speech, and whenever I think of the social network, I just, I think of that dark, ominous kind of tone theme song to it that is in the trailer, it's in the opening scene, it's in like the, op the opening credits to this movie, it's just very just burned into my brain in a good way. Uh, so yeah, bo both go to social network for me. Yeah, and I'm going to agree with that as too. Both, both of mine would go towards social network for pretty much the same reasons you said, like that, um, that kind of like subdued, like one note kind of song that plays through social network is really um like yeah it just it just it gives you this feeling of like a little bit of unease which i think this movie is kind of about like are we supposed to like this guy or not like how do we feel about social media how do we not and but like at the same time it totally gives you that feeling like it it's very similar to like the sound of like when you boot up a mac it's so, like <laughs> i like that just has the tones to it that just like it makes you think of computers and and stuff and uh what's actually kind of disappointing about king's speech is um uh, and I'm going to butcher this name. I, I'm not good with French pronunciations, but <laughs> Alexandre Desplat did the score for King's Speech. And, like, he's been nominated a number of times for um, uh, the Oscars. And I think he won for Shape of Water, hmm? if I remember correctly. And, yeah, there was nothing remarkable about the, the music in King's Speech at all. So, um, yep, two votes to Social Network for that for me. Okay, so a... Clean, uh, sweep for the social network. Yes. And now, and that one was pretty. I think that one was going to be pretty clear cut or kind of easy. I mm -hmm. think to mm -hmm. to tell. I'm trying to look up the composer here for you. There are a lot of too many credits to scroll through. So, oh, sorry, not going to do that. <laughs> um, for what the King speech? Yeah. Right, you were trying to figure yeah, out... Yeah, no, he, I mean, he, he was nominated for the score. Uh, well, I was trying to see what he won for. Oh, okay. Because you thought he won for... Um, for Shape of Water. Yeah. I'll look it up while you're talking through the next thing. <laughs> okay. 
I know how to navigate IMDb on my phone so much easier than on, on a laptop. I don't know why that's so stupid. I was putting his name. Hey, you don't know how to spell that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the next category is story and writing. So this is, you again, get two, uh, you know, tally points. And so basically it's dialogue versus, like, overall story. Which which one of the, you know, did you like more? And if you thought one movie had the better in both, then you can give both to it. Uh, for me, this is a split. So I, I don't think you can beat uh, Aaron Sorkin. This is kind of him at his best. I know... Uh, there is some clever dialogue in the King's speech as well, like the snarky jokes and all that stuff. But I think the dialogue in Social Network is fantastic. So I'm definitely giving it, you know, that to, uh, to Social Network. But overall story was kind of tough for me because basically I just looked in a general term of, okay, one movie is about a guy trying to get over a stammer who has become king. And the other one is about a bunch of people who have created a social network site. Like, when you really break it down, neither sound too compelling. But, I mean, that is kind of without context. Like, Facebook changed social media in general. And, the and you know, Albert became king of a country. And, you know... As his family had done for hundreds of generations before. Yeah, and, and before. they're kind of entering this era of radio where your voice is going to be heard. So, you need to know how to speak. So I, I'm kind of I think I'm giving the story to the king's speech because I mean he's he's king right and he has to like get over a stammer to lead a country like that's kind of got a little more compelling nature to me than uh, you know a tech company trying to start up so that's why it's split for me. Yeah, no, I I think that's a really good point because that's kind of what I was trying to debate in terms of like overall story. It's like they're both biopics like. Really, like whose whose story is more interesting? Yeah, but King's Speech is a little more accurate, if that means anything. I mean, sure. you can just judge this on movie like merit, like whether it's how accurate it is doesn't have to, you know, take any consideration. But there is that. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, I I'm giving the overall story to the King's Speech just because I feel like we're coming at it with a less biased lens. Like, I, I feel like the slant or, like, the spin on social network is that, yeah, you're really not supposed to like Mark. You're not supposed to like any of these people. And for someone, if we look at the King's speech, I don't always connect with the royals because it's like, oh, my God, you are so out of touch with, like, normal life. But I think they made Birdie really... Not necessarily relatable, but you could... Like, you, you felt for him and his struggles. And, like, the struggles that Mark Zuckerberg had portrayed in this movie, I was kind of like, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. So, story, I'm going to go with King's Speech. And, like I said, just some of the cheesy dialogue and stuff in Social Network, I'm just going to give overall writing to King's Speech as well. Okay. All right, so next is acting. Like, which movie did you think had a better leading performance? And then which one had better supporting cast? Uh, for me, this one was kind of easy. Uh, both are going to the King's Speech for me. Uh, Colin Firth is fantastic. He won an Oscar for his role. Not that that like, necessarily has to go into consideration when making your decision. But uh, he won, and I think... Uh, so him over Jesse Eisenberg, I think, is kind of easy-ish. And then for supporting, I think Helena Bottom Carter and Jeffrey Rush were fantastic. And, you know, Justin Timberlake did a pretty good job in one of his few acting roles. And I really did like Andrew Garfield in this, but I, I think the other two were were just better. So both, both are going to the King's Speech for me. And for me, I'm going to split this. Um... I completely agree that I think, um, you know, leading role, really like Colin Firth's portrayal and, you know, just the fact, like, I remember reading up on this uh, when The Crown first came out, just, like, that period of time and just, like, the royal family, they even had, like, a different English dialect than, like, quote-unquote, the commoners. And so it's, like, the work he had to do to get, like, his accent correct and 
you know, working through, like, acting a, a stammer as well, I think was really impressive. But in terms of, like, overall cast, I just, I really enjoyed the overall cast in The Social Network. Um, yeah, I, I loved Andrew Garfield. Um, even just, like, the minor characters and stuff. I think everyone was just, I think they were a little more, like, they had, like, the volume turned up. Like, they were just a little bit more interesting. So, I'm going to split this one. Okay. Very fair. Uh, so, better movie. So, you know, a tally for which one is your favorite out of the two. And a tally for which one you think is just the better movie. Could be different ones. Could be the same one. Uh, I am kind of... Uh, I think I'm splitting the vote on this. My favorite one, which, you know, we'll talk about our scores when we're done with this is a social network uh but i can see that the king's speech is like the better movie uh not that this uh went into my decision or anything but i think on uh imdb it's got a better score i think round tomatoes are pretty close but i think just overall it's kind of considered a, a better movie so and i i can kind of get behind that so i i'm splitting my vote on this one okay um, and I'm going to give both mine a King's Speech. It was really hard to make a decision between the two, but yeah, I think I'm going to give both of them a King's Speech. You're right that I think it's just a better film, but um, I think because the story was a little bit more well-rounded, um, that, like, in terms of, like, the characters and just kind of how you feel about the people involved, it's m my favorite as well, if we're looking at just these two. Yep. Okay, fair enough. Well, the total tally then is 12 to 8 in favor of the King's Speech, which I get. Like I, I said, the social network is uh, my favorite of the two, uh, which really quick, my score is uh, 9.1 for social network and 8.6 for the King's Speech. Uh, I think it is, it is pretty tough to decide between the two. What was it? Gandhi and E.T. was like, oh, this is the toughest to choose between. <laughs> yeah. This one was kind of up there for me, too, because I think there are aspects to both that are um, that are really good. I will say I wish Social Network would have won Best Picture. Like that, It's my favorite. Like That's the one I wish would have won, but sounds like you maybe are okay with the King's Speech winning Best Picture. Yeah, yeah, I am, and... You know, like I said, it's they're completely different stories, and so it's kind of hard to compare these two because they're about very different time periods and different things. But um, like the King's Speech has held up over the last ten years, where I feel like Social Network hasn't held up as much. Like I said, maybe that's just because like I'm over Facebook, like personally, like some of that stuff. I'm just like, I don't care anymore. So maybe that has something to do with it, and maybe the King's Speech is still something that I don't know a lot about, and so it's still interesting, mm -hmm. like I'm still learning about it. So maybe that has something to do with it, maybe that's kind of altering my opinion, but, um, you know, like sometimes we look at movies and you go, how did that win Best Picture? I feel like if Social Network had won Best Picture, that would be one where I would look at and go, how did this win Best Picture? All right, that's fair, and we'll, we'll get into Best Picture in a little bit, but like, I'm okay with King's Speech winning. Um, you're right, like, I, I, I would have been okay with either one winning, but, yeah, I don't know, it was tough, it was a tough one. Yeah. I could, I would have called, I would have bet money on King's Speech winning, because that just sure. has Oscar sure. vibes to it, but, <laughs> Yes, it does. Uh, so yeah. But yeah, what were your scores? Did you... Um, so my score for the King's Speech is an 8.7, Sue and I are very close on that one, um, and then the social network for me is an 8.3. 8.7 and 8.3. All right, yeah, they're yeah. pretty close to each other. Mm -hmm. Both, you know, above the usual, like, 7 or whatever. whatever you yeah, know. I'm, but, like, a solid, like, 7.8. 7 7.8 is, like, mm -hmm. a, I feel like my go-to score for movies. So, that are, like, pretty good. But, no, I, I think both of these movies are above average. And, um... Yeah, King's Speech was so much more entertaining than uh, I remembered it being, so it was fun watching that again. I feel like you probably had a couple eye rolls at me when I was busting out laughing at some of the stuff. You're like, is it really that funny? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so looking at the 83rd... Actually, before we get into that, some movies that we watched from 2010, kind of getting ready for this. 
uh, movies that I watched without you were Winter's Bone and Beautiful. Uh, they were both pretty good. We'll get into it a little later. But Winter's Bone was like Jennifer Lawrence's breakout role, uh, her first Oscar nomination, and I think it got a Best Picture nom- nomination. It's kind of the indie-ish darling of the year, kind of a low-budget movie, but it was uh, pretty good. It's about, you know, she's the oldest child of three, and her dad is a meth, like, creator. <laughs> like, you know, he makes meth, uh, but he's been missing for uh, a while now, and her mom is kind of incapacitated and, like, not su- suited to, like, do too much, and apparently her dad, when he, the last time he got arrested, put their house up for, like, bonds or like uh, as collateral for his bail and if he misses bail then they lose the house so she kind of goes on a a hunt to find him and kind of you know turning some some stones in the wrong places uh people start getting upset that she's looking for him uh and beautiful was a uh film by alejandro inarito he would uh, how do you pronounce it better than me (laughs) it's inarito inarito got the accent there uh yeah. so this is pre him winning two oscars for the revenant and uh birdman but it stars javier bardem it's in subtitles it was nominated for two oscars uh best foreign language film and then javier bardem was the surprise nominee for best actor it's kind of interesting it's two and a half hours long so it was kind of a long movie but he plays this single father who can communicate with the dead but I'll be honest, that very rarely comes up in the movie. I think three times it comes up. I was very surprised by that. It's basically just a movie about him raising his kids while kind of supporting this illegal labor effort where they're using these like uh, Chinese immigrants as cheap labor at a construction site. So it's kind of interesting. The the speaking to the dead thing very rarely gets used. I was kind of surprised by that, but it was overall pretty good. And then some movies that we watched together going into this. I had never seen Black Swan. You had seen it before. Yes. Uh, so that was really good. Darren Aronofsky and Natalie Portman's, uh, you know, she won the Oscar for it. Uh, that's a crazy movie of just her slowly going insane while trying to kind of change her personality to fit the lead role of Swan Lake. Uh, so, yeah, what a crazy movie that was. Um, then we watched The Kids Are All Right, which you had never seen before. No, I hadn't. This was also kind of, I guess, an indie-ish darling, mm-hmm. too. Uh, it was nominated for Best uh, Actor and a couple other Oscars. Uh, but that's pretty good. It's kind of a you know, short, sweet kind of, kind of movie, To Julianne Moore and Annette Bening are, are married with kids that each of them carry while using the same sperm donor and Mark Ruffalo is the sperm donor and he sh- kind of the kids go looking for him and bring him into their lives yeah, it's so kind it's of like, a quirky movie yeah <laughs> fascinating movie about yeah family and relationships and uh yeah it was really enjoyable mm-hmm. and then one the last one we watched which Oscar wise really not a whole lot there but I think kind of a fun movie Scott Pilgrim versus the world yeah which <laughs> It's kind of, it's based off a comic. It's kind of this, you know, lives, but kind of in a video game type thing where Michael Sarah is in love with this girl and to go out with her, he has to defeat her seven exes, not ex-boyfriends, but exes, uh, in kind of a Mortal Kombat 1v1 <laughs> fighting format, which is kind of, I don't know, it's fun. I like that movie yeah, a lot, Yeah, yeah, no, it was... Yeah, super fun. You know, funny, quirky again, but like visually really cool. Mm-hmm. You kind of get those. Yeah. Oh, the visuals are like so Like the cool. swooshes or like the kind of video game action moves or the the what like every gets time, a life and. <laughs> yeah, every time the phone rang, it'd be like this like script across the screen being like ring, like yeah. you would see in a comic book. Yeah, it was really cool. And a bunch of people in it, like the opening credits. <laughs> yeah. You're like, Anna Kendrick is in this. Uh, Aubrey Plaza. Oh my god. Karen Chris, Kalkin? Yeah, Kalkin? just like everyone. I'm Chris like, Evans? Chris Evans! Yeah, Chris, <laughs> yeah. Jason Schwartz, but yeah, so just a bunch of people in it. It's just, it's a fun movie, so those are the ones we kind of rewatched going into this. Uh, a Martin Scorsese movie came out in 2010, my favorite director in Shutter Island. I think this is kind of one of his more blockbuster-driven movies. It is an atypical Martin Scorsese 
Uh, it is, it's still good. It isn't one of my favorite Martin Scorsese movies. I wouldn't put it in his top echelon of, of Scorsese films or of his filmography. Uh, but still good. It's got Leo. It's got Mark Ruffalo. So, hey, Mark Ruffalo, he did two movies in 2010, I guess. Uh, still very good. Just wanted to highlight that because it's Marty. Got to do it. Also, one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, 2010 was the release of M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. So, this is based on the cartoon or animated show from Nickelodeon. Uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, they threw Avatar out of the title of the movie, so I wouldn't get confused with James Cameron's Avatar. Uh, I never saw this. I love the cartoon. It's on uh, like Netflix or something right now. I think it is Netflix. Go watch that. Everyone should just watch that. It is three seasons, 20 episodes a, a season, and only 20 minutes each, though. But the show is amazing. This movie uh, just... I haven't seen it, and I'm going to just say it. It sucks. I remember my brother went and saw it, uh, Midnight Showing, because he, he was excited for it, and just coming home and looking defeated. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, don't ever see this movie. Go watch the show instead. Just needed to make that little public announcement there. <laughs> going into the 83rd Academy Awards. So, yeah, did you want to lead us off with the screenplays and who was nominated and won? Sure. Uh, but before I do that, um, I wanted to circle back because I did look up Alexandre Desplat. And he did win for Shape of Water. He has also won for original score on um, Grand Budapest Hotel. Okay. So, there you go. Just want to throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, like I said, he's been nominated a lot lately. So, there we go. Um, okay, so the screen adapted screenplay nominees uh, for the 2010, 2010 films uh, were 127 Hours, Toy Story 3, True Grit, Winter's Bone, and then the winner went to Aaron Sorkin for The Social Network. Yeah, this I mean, we kind of brought it up in the writing section. I think Aaron Sorkin rightfully won for this. I think his screenplay is <laughs> fantastic. 127 hours we'll talk about that a little bit more but that's a really good movie and that's one where it's kind of one guy on the screen the whole time yeah it's kind of castaway ish so you know they kind of incorporate him talking into the camera to get some dialogue in there so that that is pretty that's a pretty good um movie script wise i guess i don't know like because it's just one guy I guess I don't know how great that script really is, but, you know, I guess it does keep you engaged throughout the whole movie, so there's something to be said there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Toy Story 3, it's kind of fun seeing an animated movie get some love with screenplay. Yeah. You know, so I I do like seeing that. I mean, what an emotional movie, right? At the time, thinking it was the last Toy Story movie, and you get the scene at the end where you think they're all going to die. They they don't, they don't, you know, but... (laughs) Uh, kind of nice seeing that movie get a little love there. Mm-hmm. True Grit, uh, I sure I guess uh, it's a remake, uh, so it's happened already. Like the one with John Wayne. I get this is kind of a a more uh, I don't want to say realistic. Well, I'm realistic, but it holds true to the the book a little bit better from what I hear. So you know, I guess you can give it to that. Um, but that that movie is is really good. It's just always weird seeing a like a remake kind of get an, a nomination because it's kind of been done already. But mm-hmm. you know, it's the Cohen brothers, so they're kind of the standard. You know, if they have a movie come out, they'll get a nomination. Like Buster <laughs> Scruggs. I haven't seen it, but from what I hear, that movie sucks, and they got an Oscar nomination <laughs> for it. Uh, Winter's Bone. I I'm okay with that because uh, it was really good, and it it kind of shows you it takes place in the Ozark Mountains, and it kind of shows you the lower class lives of. Like, the, that group of people. So that was kind of interesting, but I'm good with Social Network winning. Uh, on the flip side, for original screenplay, the nominees that year were Another Year, The Fighter, Inception, uh, The Kids Are All Right, and then the winning screenplay went to David Seidler for The King's Speech. Yeah, so there you go. The two movies we debated both won yep. screenplay, so <laughs> yep. there you go. I uh, haven't seen another year, so I can't speak too much to that. Mike Lee, that name looks familiar, though, so I feel like I know his work. Uh, the Fighter is pretty good with Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, it was um, a good movie, Christian Bale. Yep. Yeah. Uh, kids, I, so I don't know, like, I might give it to Inception, 
or the kids are all right. I might give it to Inception because how trippy is that movie to to incorporate dreams into like a story like that, and for it to kind of make sense too. That movie kind of gets joked upon, like, "Oh, this movie makes zero sense." Like, "Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. whatever. It's a Nolan movie that doesn't make sense." I think it makes sense. Like you think of dreams as like very simple, and then they ramped it up to something super complex in terms of like putting all these like dreams inside of dreams. But then taking it back down to, like, this is actually a really simple idea. Yeah, and I like how they kind of take things that happen to people, like, in their dreams every day and just be, like, incorporating the movie. So <laughs> Having I an love, explanation yeah, for it. I love, or just acknowledging it, yeah. like, uh, when Leo and Ellen Page are at the diner for the first time and they're talking, and she's like, oh, we're in a dream right now? He goes, yeah, we never, rem- we never like know the start of our dreams and we always yeah. just end up somewhere yeah I'm like that's, that's right. so true i never remembered the beginning of my dreams he's like do you remember See, like how, how we, we got, got here? here yeah and i'm just like oh my god that's awesome and i love how like dream like we can fall asleep for half an hour but we feel like we dreamt for hours and they incorporate that and they're like oh uh, what is it like an hour uh, five minutes in the real world is like an hour in the dream world or something like like that so i just love how they take these little things that we all have probably experienced with dreams (laughs) and then make them like an integral part of the plot so i would give it to inception um if we move to the supporting actress nominees that year uh amy adams was nominated for the fighter helena bonham carter nominated for the king's speech Haley Steinfeld, one of the youngest nominees for True Grit, uh, Jackie Weaver for Animal Kingdom, and the winner went to Melissa Leo for The Fighter. Yeah, I uh, I haven't seen Animal Kingdom. It's hard to argue with a lot of these. Amy Adams and Melissa Leo from The Fighter. I mean, they're both great. Uh, we've talked about how much we liked Helen Bonham Carter in King's Speech, and yeah, Haley Steinfeld, I mean, what a breakout role that was. And she was fantastic, and it's tough for child actors, I think, in roles all the time, but she was fantastic in it. Uh, someone who's kind of, who's missing from this, I think, is Mila Kunis from Black Swan. Uh, going into it, I kind of just knew that she obviously was in it, but I think she got some, like, Golden Globe and SAG nominations for it. I, I thought she was pretty good in it. I'm, I would probably take out Jackie Weaver to put in Mila Kunis. I don't always love taking out someone in a role that I haven't seen. But, you know, it's just hard to argue with the rest of them. As far as the winner goes, uh, Melissa Lee was okay in the fighter. I didn't think she was fantastic. I would honestly give it to Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah, I thought she no, was I, fantastic. I and I feel like it was, um, yeah, a bit of a surprise or somewhat of an upset Melissa Leo won. So, um, yeah, I would agree that Helena Bonham Carter was definitely, like, a, a favorite role of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking at supporting actor nominees that year, we had John Hawks for Winter's Bone, Jeremy Renner for The Town, Mark Ruffalo for The Kids Are All Right, Jeffrey Rush for the King's Speech, and then Christian Bale was the winner for The Fighter. Yeah, so Christian Bale, he finally got an Oscar win. I think it's his only one of his career. John Hawks is kind of a surprise nominee for, for Winter's Bone. He plays Jennifer Lawrence's character's uncle, so the brother of her father. So he he's kind of this rough guy who ends up helping her a little bit in the end. He was really good, and he's an actor that's been around for a while, so it's kind of nice seeing him uh, get some love here. Uh, Jeremy Renner, hot off of his nomination for Hurt Locker, he gets nominated for The Town. And he is, like, he's really good in that movie. Mark Ruffalo, kids are all right. I love Mark Ruffalo, so I like seeing him get any love he can get. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Rush, we've talked about in his role. Uh, notable person missing, Andrew Garfield. I don't know if he really got a whole lot of love in at the SAGs or Globes, but I thought he was really good in the social network. I thought he was so network. good. No, I think that's a really good point. Um... Uh, yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought him up. I'm glad you, um, like, recognize the... Because I, I, I think he did a good job, too. Yeah, I thought I would... I'm, tr- I'm trying to see if there's, like, a way to get him <laughs> in. I don't know who I would necessarily take out uh, of their... They're not like the easy choice is John Hawks is to take him out and put and put Andrew Garfield in, but it's kind of nice seeing that 
like kind of veteran in the industry finally get a nomination. Uh, but as far as the winner goes, I, I Christian Bill was good, and it's kind of nice seeing him get a win because he is that actor, like right. Everyone knows that about Christian Bale. He will change his body. He will do he's do everything to get into his role. So playing that the drug addicted older brother to Mickey Ward, like he got super skinny for this role. Like he did. He really like in some degrees became that role. But I honestly really like Jeffrey Rush. I wouldn't mind giving the win to Jeffrey Rush. Um I probably would. Like Christian Bale might be second or third on my list of favorite roles here like Jeremy Renner was even really good and Mark Ruffalo was always good so I don't know I might give it to Jeffrey Rush oh you've seen a couple of these movies did you have any thoughts on best supporting actor yeah I I mean maybe some of it's a little recency bias that um I I really enjoyed Mark Ruffalo and and Jeffrey Rush and I think Jeff Rush did like it's it almost feels sad to me that he's like a supporting actor because I'm like oh I feel like he was like the person that tied everything together in the movie. So, um, you know, I almost feel like he could be a leading actor, but, um, yeah, no, really great performance. And yeah, I I almost feel like the award went to Christian Bale because of just like the physical changes and stuff he made for the role, but who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, looking at the best actress nominees that year we had, Annette Benning for The Kids Are All Right, Nicole Kidman for Rabbit Hole, Jennifer Lawrence for Winter's Bone, and Michelle Williams for Blue Valentine. Uh, the winner went to Natalie Portman in Black Swan. So I haven't seen all of these. I, I tried to watch them, uh, like Blue Valentine and Rabbit Hole, I think, are on HBO. So I'll, pro- I'll, I'll get to them and watch them eventually. From what I hear, Michelle Williams is phenomenal in Blue Valentine. Uh, co-star, you know, Ryan Gosling is in that as well. I talked a little bit about Winter's Bone, Jennifer Lawrence. I love that she got a nomination for that role. Like, it's a young, you know, she's a little bit younger, but it's an indie movie, so it's kind of nice getting that recognition. I can't say a whole lot about Rabbit Hole and Nicole Kidman. Uh, Annette Benning, though, you know, we just saw the kids are all right. She was fantastic in that. I mean, just that movie in general, I think, was really good, and I'm glad that it got a little bit of love here. I mean, Natalie Portman was a runaway freight train in this category oh for God. all the award ceremonies. Yeah. And she won, rightfully so. Hands like, down. I, there's no way I'm going to pick anyone over her. Some notable people not nominated. I mean, the co star in The Kids Are All Right, Julianne Moore, yeah, wasn't I know. nominated. I, I almost liked her, her more. <laughs> I, I did too. Than actually. Annette Benning. So, I mean, maybe I, this is without seeing it, but I would maybe put her in over Nicole Kidman. But yeah, I mean, Natalie Portman was just yeah, I mean, so amazing in Black Swan. Just uh, yeah, that every, movie. Everything about the role was, I think, really yeah, well done. and it was just so good on how you know her instructor is like, if you were just the white swan, like it'd be easy, and you can just see that in the way she acts. Like she's this very like I'm perfect robotic person, but like it was just amazing how like how. He was trying to get, like, this dark side out of her and the way she acted and trying to do it but not being able to and then doing it in the end and all the psychological stuff behind it. That was just amazing. I guess, quick side note, notable person missing for a supporting actor, not to go back too much there, but her instructor, that guy, I'm trying to, he's in the Oceans movies as, um, yes, yes, as the, the Night Fox. Yep. Uh, he was really good in that. I was kind of getting vibes of like J.K. Simmons from Whiplash mm-hmm. a little bit in it, mm-hmm. and not to that degree. Like J.K. Simmons, that was amazing, but he's this instructor trying to get a little bit more out of the student, almost at no cost, like anything to yeah. do it. Yeah, um, he definitely crossed some lines. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, but he he was actually really good in that movie. I wouldn't mind seeing him get a nomination either. Uh, but yeah, Natalie Portman, she was just phenomenal in Black Swan. That was yeah, it, her award. It almost take doesn't it. matter, like, if you wanted to replace anyone else in the nominees. It's yeah. like she's winning Best Actress. And, anyway. <laughs> and again, that's good, but Best Supporting Actress, her mom, Barbara Hershey, her mom was kind of like a. That was oh. a subtle good role, too. The creepy, protective mom. Oh, God. That was something, too. Her like, mom is a nightmare. Yeah, yes. <laughs> 
if we go to the Best Actor nominees that year, uh, as you mentioned, Javier Bardem in Beautiful, Jeff Bridges in True Grit, uh, Jesse Eisenberg for The Social Network, James Franco for 127 Hours, and uh, the winner, like we mentioned, was Colin Firth for The King's Speech. Yeah, but, uh, this is a pretty loaded-ish category. I mean, Jeff Bridges in True Grit, this is coming off of uh, Crazy Heart when he won his Oscar, and I just remember backing it up with that performance in, in True Grit. It was phenomenal. I mean, John Wayne won an Oscar for that role back in 69, but I think Jeff Bridges did it better. I think the John Wayne thing was like, all right, here's the career <laughs> achievement award. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, he was phenomenal in that movie. And, oh, I keep going back, no, notable person Matt Damon in that movie for a supporting actor could have gotten a little bit of love. Uh, love too. He played La Bouf. Uh but yeah, Jeff Bridges fantastic as uh, Rooster Cogburn. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg. This is his only nomination, and yeah, rightfully so. I mean, he is that subtle, kind of creepy-ish role. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, but you know the way he played that role where you don't exactly know his motivations, and he kind of played that you know atypical mindset of like I'm just getting this thing done. This is what I care about. Um, James Franco, this was the first role that I went, oh, he's a serious actor. <laughs> right. Like, I, and I know, like, some things have come out about him since then, but I remember when I was actually pulling for him to win going into the Oscars, uh, because I just, it's that whole, you're the only thing on screen for an hour and a half or however long this movie is. And to be that good and captivating, I was I was kind of pulling for him to win, but I understand why Colin Firth won. I mean, this was his role, his Oscar. I don't think anyone was really going to, maybe not to the degree of Natalie Portman, but I think it was he was pretty much the favorite going in. And, you know, rightfully so, I get it. Like, he's playing a real-life person, and uh, he played it very well. Like, he had the stammer down. He had, uh, I think, some mannerisms and just the way he talks, like, some things down. And he was kind of that well-known actor who never really got a bunch of award love. And here he is, like, with this big role. And he did do a good job. Surprise nominee, as I mentioned, was Javier Bardem in Beautiful. I get it after seeing it. Like, he was very good in that as this, you know, very poor but loving father of these kids that he's just trying to get through life and you know he's got this estranged wife that he has to kind of take care of too i mean it was very good notable misses mark Wahlberg and the fighter i mean if it wasn't for him that movie would never been made it would have been kind of nice for him to get a little love for that ryan gosling in uh, blue valentine uh you know he wasn't nominated as well uh but i i'm okay with colin firth winning i'm gonna keep him as the winner like i think uh, total understandable and rightfully so that he won that oscar perfect um the director nominees that year were darren aronofsky for black swan david o russell for the fighter david fincher for the social network joel and ethan cohen for true grit and then the winner was tom hooper for the king's speech i think this should have just easily been Dare, uh, David Fincher. Uh, King's Speech is good. I don't think Tom Hooper did anything crazy. No. I'm, like, amazing yeah. with this. Uh, but David Fincher, I think, like, the way that he shot and, and made that movie, like, I think he should have won this pretty pretty easily, actually. This is my, like, big, like, egregious one. Uh, I think he won a lot of the awards going into this. I think he won the Golden Globe and, and maybe the Director's Guild Award too going into this. So I, I think he should have won. That's kind of, this is a short one for me. I, I think he should have won. That's fair. All right. The only thing I have to add is that um, Best Director can only go to one nominee unless <laughs> yeah. they're an established duo like the Coen brothers. So mm-hmm. thought I'd point that out. Yeah. I feel like actually I might have brought that up on the show before, but anyway. Maybe the No Country for Old Men episode. Probably. Um, Best Picture nominees. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was this the first year where they expanded the nominees? I don't think so. I think the year before was. Okay. Well, this is our first. This is our first time going through um, 
Best Picture nominees where they had more than five. The year before All was the year that. before was the first year. Uh, but yeah, ten nominees this ten year. Ten nominees, yes. Full ten nominees. Okay, so the nominees that year were 127 Hours, Black Swan, The Fighter, Inception, The Kids Are All Right, The Social Network, Toy Story 3, True Grit, Winter's Bone, and of course, The King's Speech was your winner that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, so it was up to ten, so they maxed out on the number of nominees. Uh, also, quick side note, I should have mentioned in Best Director, some no-shows, Danny Boyle, Christopher Nolan, I would have given either of them a nomination over Tom Hooper and probably David O. Russell. So just quick side note there. Okay. Anyways, really the only movie that I think is maybe missing from this is The Town. I really like The Town. Um, you know, directed by Ben Affleck. Uh, I I mean, I like The Town maybe more than The fight. The Fighter's good i didn't it wasn't like mind-blowing to me there's better boxing movies out there for me like it's a true story and an amazing story but i don't know just the way the movie was shot and made and told i thought was a little underwhelming and you know expected a little bit better of a story from it uh but i i can't argue too much with a lot of these movies obviously we've talked about the king's speech i think 147 hours is fantastic black swan was amazing uh i just talked about the fighter inception i think was phenomenal uh, the way that that story was told, and yeah, that, that movie is just visually, too, just mind-blowing. Uh, Kids Are Alright and Winter's Bone are kind of the indie movies that's nice to see some love. Social Network we talked about, and Toy Story 3, I like that an animated movie is getting a little love here. I I, I don't know if it should have gotten a Best Picture nominee. It probably deserved it, so it's just hard to argue with any of these nominees. Out of these, which one is my favorite? Probably Inception. Like, that one is the one I would maybe give Best Picture to over any of these. You know, if I were ranking them, it'd be that. And then maybe The Social Network. And then Black Swan. And then The King's Speech. So King's Speech is maybe, like, fourth on this list of, like, favorites to me. I get better. It's probably up there a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. But as far as, like, favorites for me, it, it might be, like, third or fourth on the list. Yeah. And... So I was kind of impressed myself. I've seen nine of these movies, mm-hmm. nine of the ten. But honestly, like, Black Swan still, like, blows me away. Like, I think I like that just as much as King's Speech, probably a little bit more than King's Speech. Yeah. It's just, um, yeah, it's just creepy and fascinating and, um, like, a little trippy, too. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I really enjoy Black Swan. Awesome. So there you go, the 83rd Oscars. Uh, I think overall they actually did a pretty good job at these Oscars. Yeah. The only other notes I really had is in, as far as the acting categories, though, I guess leading into the Oscars, it was kind of um, pushed the narrative of an older actor versus a younger actor for each of the categories was pushed, like Firth versus Franco. Those were kind of the two like, leading contenders. Yeah. Portman versus uh, Annette Benning was kind of the leading, like, contenders for that, although Portman, I think, was an easy winner there. Um, Jeffrey Rush versus Christian Bale. And then uh, Melissa Leo versus Haley Steinfeld. Those <laughs> were kind of the leading yeah. categories for yeah. each one. Um, there were eight, eight of the 20 performances were first-timers, first-time nominees, so that's kind of cool. Uh, There were no African-American nominees, so a little Oscar no white there, or so white there. Uh, And there was only one non-English speaking performance that was nominated, and that was Javier Bardem's role. So, uh, so yeah, all four winners in the category was their their first time winner. So, kind of cool. Oh, it is very cool. Nice. All right. So, last thing is our rankings. So, we didn't say this off the top, but because or in honor of... uh, the King's Speech, we're doing our top five films about royals. Yes, our favorites. So just the movies, not necessarily characters, but movies about royals. Yep. All right. So what? who wants to go first? Doesn't matter. Okay, I'll go first. We're going five, five through one, right? Five to okay. one, yep. My number five is Shrek. Nice. <laughs> Princess Fiona. Yes. And Lord Farquaad. He's not necessarily <laughs> royal, but... So yeah, Shrek. He's a lord. That's, that's oh, like lord. A, yeah. He, that's a royal position, right? All right, fair enough. I don't know. 
<laughs> I, I'm a little loose in my definitions here, I think, maybe. That's fair. Possibly. That's, let's be as loose as possible. <laughs> in all aspects of life, or just Why this not? List? Live life to its fullest. <laughs> Uh, kind of on the same line, uh, an animated film for me as well at number five, uh, Brave. Oh, okay. Yep. She's a Scottish princess. The hair flowing. Even though she doesn't really want to be. Yeah, very true. <laughs> but she is. <laughs> and her poor mother, the queen, turns into a bear. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So yeah, good, good little royal, royal story. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number four... Is a, it's a Marvel care, uh, movie. Could have been a couple. You've got Thor. It's a royal family. Any of the Thor movies. I went with uh, Black Panther. That is uh, lower down on my list. But yes, definitely in consideration. Yep. Very good choice. you got T'Challa. And technically Michael B. Jordan's character is a royal too. Because he's his cousin, I, I believe. I so. think so. Uh, so yeah. And that, that movie, like the storyline is more built around... The royal, you know, them being royals and eh, maybe a little bit more so than the Thor movies are, but mm -hmm. Thor was uh, an option too, so. Yeah, no, very good choice of Black Panther. I definitely had that uh, in consideration. Um, My number four, uh, another comic book movie, uh, Wonder Woman. Yeah, is she royal? She's Princess of the Amazons. Okay, fair. Slash her last name is Prince. <laughs> yeah. They like half give that to no, her. That's fine. I was trying to think of like nicknames like oh who is like is George the King of the Jungle? So I was gonna go like George of the sure, Jungle, but sure, no. Sure. But yeah. But yeah. No, I because I wasn't I'm like, does does this count? But yeah, she in like uh the story, yeah, she's considered a princess of the Amazons. So Alright. My number three is Star Wars, Princess Leia. Could have, I thought about going with Phantom Menace. You got Queen Amidala. <laughs> thought about going with that, but just for optics and to try to win the vote, I was just going with Star Wars and New Hope. Well, unfortunately, that's going to cancel out with my number three, which is also but, Star Wars. I'm just going to make it Phantom Menace. <laughs> no! <laughs> that's not fair. I'm not on Facebook. I can't defend myself nor see it's that you changed it that's 100 percent accurate damn you mark zuckerberg <laughs> yeah you've put me in this position 12 13 years later i don't even remember when he started this wasn't it like 04 actually yeah, i don't know i don't care um <laughs> all right so we both have star wars at number three yep my number two is lion king i guess nice i had that on my list lower down too yeah <laughs> Really? I'm, I'm glad we were on this. Yeah, yeah, Lion King. That's mm -hmm. good. <laughs> the, li like... the live action one, not the cartoon one. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> so Lion King at number two. Mm -hmm. I had that number nine-ish probably on my list. Uh, my number two, this is probably like the loosest definition of a royal, but I just really like this movie. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Uh, yeah. Because Hiccup's dad is like... He's like in charge He's of like it. the chief of the village, yeah. but I don't know if it's like a royal position. Yeah, it's a fancy word. But it's an official it. position, and it's a really good movie. So yeah. I've got How to Train Your Dragon number two. Yeah, go ahead. go with How to Train Your Dragon. Wait, the first one or the sec second one? Or does it not matter? It doesn't matter. Say, like, yeah, I, I, I like the first one a little is, better. Is his mom like the queen of dragons in the second one? So yeah, there's a, two chances at being mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. even if they're mm -hmm. both wrong. But <laughs> there you go. Um, my number one is Coming to America. Oh, I've never seen that movie. Ah, all right. So that's a fun choice. Yeah. Eddie Murphy, Prince Akeem, <laughs> Coming to, obviously, America. And uh, he works, I like how in that movie they have a knockoff of McDonald's. I can't remember what, I think it's like McDonald's, like it's <laughs> M-A-C or something like yeah. that. Um, and they have arches in a different direction, but he works there. And it's like Samuel L. Jackson's uh, like acting debut. He plays a mugger who comes in and like yeah, he has one scene. So, But yeah, no, they're making a sequel for it too, where the... That's right. Where the word two, America is just going to be the number two. 
I thought, I've, I I've thought never that, seen that before in a sequel, so it's very creative. Yeah, I, was, I thought that fad died off like 20 years ago, <laughs> and they're bringing it back for whatever reason. But yeah, there you go. That's my number one. <laughs> Good choice. Um, you mentioned this earlier in your list, but my number one is specifically, though, Thor Ragnarok. I love that movie so much. And, uh, you know, how can you argue against the uh, God of Thunder? And that's I mean, clearly the best of all the Thors. So yeah. Yeah. Good one. Makes complete sense. So I had uh, my honorable mention. So all my mine were fake characters. I kind of wanted to just do something different and say, oh, they're all going to be fake. Yeah. Uh, I think I kind of technically all, yeah, all of mine are fake, too. And Thor was a I real guess. person. Uh, well, so. Haha. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I was going to do, so I kind of threw my list together, uh, and I was going to do some joke ones, but didn't end up doing it. Uh, Prince of Persia. Oh my god. Uh, A Knight's Tale. <sighs> that's, that, that's good. But yeah, it was, more, it was more like, he ends up being of royal blood in the end, even though it's maybe fake that he is. He's I a don't knight. Know. Uh, I was going to say, cool. Man in the Iron Mask, with Leo DiCaprio. Hmm. Uh, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Got a twofer, King Aslan and the White Queen. That's a good choice. Uh, Princess Bride, more serious one. Any of the mm-hmm. Thor movies, but you brought it up. Any of the 20 King Arthur movies that have come out. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of just some of my honorable mentions. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, King's Speech was very close at number six, but Brave edged it out. I just think it's... It's just a little more cutesy, fun. I don't know. Um, but yeah, King's Speech was on my list. Black Panther, Lion King, like I mentioned. The Favorite. Um, I did not think I would like yeah. that movie. As a movie, I did not think I was going to like it. Uh, but I, I really, really I liked enjoyed it. it so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a good movie um, about real life royals, so it's kind of fun. Um, Lion King, Avatar, some others I thought of. Yeah, I was. Just, I went with fake ones because you can get really easy with the favorite, oh, the yeah. King's Speech, all these like uh, British royal movie. Like, yeah, it's really easy to pick those. So I just mm-hmm. try to go with fake ones to mm-hmm. get a little more interesting with it. Yeah, and and I want to pick movies too where it's like they're kind of the central figure because it's like oh, I really like Shakespeare in Love and like yeah, Queen Victoria. Is that right? Is in there, but she's not like a central character, so I don't want to include something like that. So I was trying to back when I thought this was gonna be like characters. Mm-hmm. I was trying to do an all top five with James Earl Jones, but I could only get three. Mm. Okay, so who are the three? Well, two of them are on my list with Mufasa and Coming to America. Okay, he's Eddie Murphy's dad. Oh, okay. Uh, he plays in Conan the Barbarian. He plays the villain who usurps the throne in this fantasy world. He technically isn't a royal, but I was going to kind of blur the line there a little bit if I could come up with two more. And I, you know, went with the thought of like, oh, is Darth Vader somehow a royal? Uh, <laughs> oh, that's what I'm trying to like, He's, he's kind of married to, yeah, he's the father of Princess Leia. I mean, I guess I could have gotten to four. His wife was a queen. On a yeah, she wasn't up. queen when they got married, but, no. but there's some ways I could have blurred that line. You could have, bit. yeah, shoehorned that in. For yeah, sure. so then I would have been one away. But yeah, I was trying to do that. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, cool. So yeah. Those are good lists. Yep. Yeah. So that's all we got. Uh, like I said, I'll send out the emojis for what our next episode will be on and the, and the movies to possibly watch for that. So keep an eye out on all our social media accounts. Which is uh, at Oscar Real Pod on both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I like so how you say Twitter. Twitter, Twitter. That could sound really bad if I say it a different way. <laughs> um, so yeah, make sure to follow us on there. I try, you know, try to post stuff when we can. Different trailers that come out and you know, some of the, the uh, images that I make. Uh, also, when it comes to this podcast, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please just. Give us a quick five-star rating and a review. Costs you nothing, but it helps us out a lot. So just give a quick uh, five-star rating. And yeah, 
that's uh, pretty much all I've got. So from Matt and Haley, this has been the Oscar Real Movie Pod.